Dr. Michael Verdelnik is professor of Jewish studies at Moody Bible Institute, where he has taught Jewish studies and Bible since 1994. The son of Holocaust survivors, he was raised in an observant Jewish home in Brooklyn, New York. Michael trusted in Jesus the Messiah as a high school student and has been teaching the Bible ever since. Sought after speaker and te teacher, Michael is a biblical scholar specializing in the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish people, the land of Israel, and biblical prophecy. Michael graduated in Jewish studies from Moody Bible Institute, earned his bachelor's degree from Azusa Pacific University, his THM degree from Dallas Theological Seminary, and his doctorate from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, focusing his studies on the Messiah of the Hebrew Bible. Michael serves as an adjunct faculty member at Dallas Theological Seminary, Talbot School of Theology, and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Michael and his wife, Eva, Eva is also an adjunct faculty member at Moody, teaching literature, education, and Jewish studies. They live in a historic Jewish Chicago neighborhood. And surprise, surprise, Israel is their favorite place in the world. <laughs> and they enjoy showing people the land as often as possible. Michael and Eva enjoy black and white movies from the golden age of Hollywood, classic literature, and hiking with their three Collies. The Radelniks have two wonderful adult sons whom they say call and write often. <laughs> Would you please join me in welcoming today Dr. Michael Radelnik? Well, I always say, please don't read that. They always say, yes, we won't. And then they do. Uh, we do have three dogs, three collies. Uh, one is named Fievel, like the mouse. Uh, another is named Frodo, like the hobbit. And the third is named Darby, like the theologian. I did that on purpose. Uh, so I figure if psychologists can have a dog named Sigmund, I can have a dog named Darby. So, uh, well, as, as, as it just was belabored, uh, I do have several uh, degrees, a couple of advanced degrees, one from Dallas Seminary. I always joke, this is going to go out on the, on, yeah, maybe I won't make, tell this joke. No, I, I always laugh about how I got an education at Dallas and a degree at Trinity. Uh, so, no, I, I do love Trinity too, but. This is very formative to be here. In fact, it was uh, 36 years ago this week that I started Dallas Seminary, which is amazing because I was a three-year-old prodigy at the time. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, actually, the only thing that I look like about the way I looked then, the only similarity is I'm wearing, a, I'm wearing a tie and jacket, which we used to have to do, and apparently no one does anymore. So <laughs> had I but known. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm very, very grateful to be here. Uh, anyway, I have, I have uh, some academic training. I was a pastor for 16 years. I've been a, a college professor teaching Bible for 22 years. And I'm not just telling you this to show off. I'm telling you this because even with that background, there are times that I have doubts. And anyone here who tells you that they don't because they've learned so much, uh, they're lying. Every one of us from time to time will have doubts. Sometimes it's not doubting God's existence or doubting the exclusivity of the Lord Jesus or it may be just doubting whether he really loves and cares for us. We all have times in our lives when we have doubts. And uh, that's what I want to talk about this morning, about what do we do when we have doubt. I, let me just give you some encouragement. In order to doubt, uh, we must believe. That's what uh, C.S. Lewis said. We must first believe in order to doubt. Because you can't doubt something you don't believe. So uh, it's very normal. Osgin has talked about 
uh, the experience of doubt being in two minds. Uh, we can either believe that's being in one mind, or we can disbelieve that's being in the other mind. But when we're in two minds, that's when we're doubting. And a lot of us experience this. I wonder if you ever doubt, if you ever have questions, if you hear that quiet voice whispering in your ear, what if this isn't true after all? What if I've staked my life on a fantasy, on a sham? What if? What if the evolutionists were right and this just happened by accident? We can all think of our what ifs. What if? What if? Well, there's a passage that teaches us how to deal with doubt, and it describes one of the greatest men in the Bible who struggled with doubt. And so if you have a Bible at Dallas, I'm guessing you'll take out a Greek New Testament, <laughs> take out your iPad with accordance on it, <laughs> check my grammar as I go through this. <laughs> Someone asked me if I was intimidated about preaching in Dallas because of the faculty. I said, no, nah, the faculty is great. It's the students that scare me. <laughs> In Matthew 11, 2 through 19, we're going to look at John the Baptist and his doubt. Uh, and we're going to look at the cause of doubt and the cure for doubt. Okay? Let's look at the passage, Matthew 11, verses 2 through 19. And it starts with the cause of doubt in verses 2 through 3. You'll see what it says. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent a message by his disciples and asked him, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Here's what the setting is, if you can imagine this. John is in prison, and he sends word to Jesus. Now, we know who John is. He is the forerunner of the Messiah. He is the messenger that was predicted in Malachi. He is the one who, who is calling for straight paths. He is the one uh, who's saying, prepare the way of the Lord. He is the one who baptized the Lord Jesus. He is the one who announced this and, and the Holy Spirit came down upon him as a dove as on the Lord Jesus. And uh, John the Baptist was there when God spoke his approval. God the Father spoke his approval of the Son at the baptism. This is John the Baptist. And now he is languishing in prison. And the reason why his disciples can come, because back then prison wasn't three square meals a day. If you ate, it was because your friends or family brought you food. And uh, if you were cold, someone could bring you something to wear. Uh, and so there is John and languishing in prison. And his disciples come. And, and John's like, this is not what I expected when I announced the coming of the Messiah. This is not at all what I wanted or thought could happen to me. And so maybe I got it wrong. Maybe this is not the coming one. He's facing death for declaring uh, that Herod Antipas' marriage to Herodias was wrong. And he ultimately will lose his head for this. And so languishing in prison, he says to his disciples, ask Jesus, are you the coming one? A title for the Messiah. Or should we look for another? Maybe I got it wrong. What's the cause of doubt in our lives and in John's life? Painful experiences. That's what causes doubt. The painful experience of being in prison is what makes John doubt. Cold, dark, damp prison, probably solitary confinement, surrounded by rats and other vermin. This is not what you expect when the Messiah comes. What makes us doubt? What kind of painful experiences make us doubt? Well, when we face difficulties like that. It could be difficulties of being unable to pay bills, a common trait among seminary students. <laughs> but also experiencing your parents getting divorced or having a mom or a dad struggling with cancer or maybe going to school and having a rebellious teen thinking, I'm trying to get through seminary and I've got a teenager that just stole a car. Uh, maybe you found marijuana in his room, or worse. Maybe some of us are facing medical situations that we never thought we'd face because we're not the right age to have this happen to us. Yeah, uh, 
Difficult experiences make us doubt. Also, when we're disappointed. I think John was disappointed. That's the other part of his painful experience, don't you think? Not was that it was just hard, but he was disappointed. Think about it. Uh, Messiah was supposed to free the captives, according to Isaiah 61. Not make captives. <laughs> this is really disappointing. Why am I being persecuted by a wicked king when I have announced the coming of the righteous king? How, how could this happen to me? This is not a righteous kingdom, but a corrupt king and a cruel governor. How did I get here? So it's not just difficulties, it's disappointment that forms the pain in our lives that cause us to doubt. We get disappointed when the marriage that we thought was going to be so wonderful to the glory of God is hitting the rocks. This is not what we expected. Uh, we thought we'd have the perfect family or the perfect life. We'd have the perfect job. We'd have the perfect ministry. And things go in a way that we didn't expect. And the joyride with Jesus is not turning out to be so fun. Why do we doubt? The same reason John the Baptist doubt, doubted. Because of, of uh, difficult and disappointing experiences that caused a lot of pain in his life. That's why we doubt as well. Well, I don't want to leave us there. That's pretty bummed out, right? Is there a cure for this? Is there a way to get beyond doubt? I do believe when we encounter the living word, the Lord Jesus, the true Messiah, he can cure our doubts. Pick it up in verse 4. I'm going to read all the way to verse 19. Jesus replied to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, those with skin diseases are healed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And if anyone is not offended because of me, he is blessed. As these men away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? Look, those who wear soft clothes are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and far more than a prophet. This is the one it was written about. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before me. I assure you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. For the days of John the Baptist until now, from the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence and violent and the violent have been seizing it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. If you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Anyone who has ears should listen. To what should I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to each other. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament, but you didn't mourn. For John did not come eating or drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Now, in this encounter with the, risen, with the, the king Messiah, not yet risen, but soon to be risen, the king Messiah, the living word, there are four principles, I believe, that he presents about how to overcome doubt. Here's the first one. Remember the evidence. If you look at what Jesus says in verses 4 through 6, he reminds them of the evidence. He says, report what you see and hear. The lame walk, those with skin diseases are healed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor are told the good news. Now, what Jesus is doing there is he is conflating two messianic prophecies, Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61 bringing them together and saying, look, this is what was predicted of the Messiah. And then he says, and you, he would, if he could say this, I think he would, go back and read Matthew 8 and 9, <laughs> just a couple chapters before, and you will see this is exactly what I have done. I have fulfilled these prophecies. He is saying, go back, tell John the evidence, review the evidence. That's what we need to do. 
when we begin to doubt. We need to go back and review the evidence that convinced us in the first place. And what I like about this is what convinced me in the first place was Messianic prophecy. I was raised in a traditional, observant Jewish home. My parents were both Holocaust survivors. If you were to ask me, would you ever believe in Jesus when I was a kid, I would have said, oh, no, <laughs> never, 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 never. And yet, when I was a freshman in high school, my mom went public. She had been a secret believer since she was 16. She endured uh, the Gross Rosen concentration camp, the, the Ludge Ghetto before that, uh, as a believer in Jesus. And then she married my dad after the war, whose wife had died and had four sons. His first four sons were murdered and his daughter was murdered. And uh, he remarried after the war. His wife died in childbirth. And he had a premature baby, my brother. And he didn't know what to do. And he was in a hospital in Berlin and saw my mom. He had met her once in the Ludge Ghetto. And he went up to her and said, I need you to marry me. I need someone to care for this baby. It was like Tevye. He skipped uh, the matchmaker and just went right up. <laughs> and uh, my mom was almost 20 years younger than he was, but she felt bad for that baby and married him. And then after they married, uh, he said, if you ever tell anyone that you believe this, I will divorce you. And so she was a secret believer up until 1972. And then their marriage was having some difficulties. She went and found a messianic congregation started by Chosen People Ministries in Brooklyn. She started meeting with a Bible teacher there. She went public. My dad, good to his word, divorced her. I was really furious with my mom because she got custody. I was a teenager. And I tried. I, we fought so much. And then I thought, I'm going to go to this teacher. This is a very nutshell version. But I'm going to go to this teacher who's teaching my mom the Bible. And I am going to show her how wrong she is. And then she, my mom will give up this stupidity. Because every time I would show my mom stuff, she'd say, but Miss Kozer says. So I'm going to show Miss Kozer she's wrong. And we met, and we met, and we met. And I would argue with her about Messianic prophecy. And I was very confident. I had a book that told me what the answers were. <laughs> it was a medieval book called Faith Strengthened. Uh, but you know what? I'd leave and think, you know, her answers make more sense than mine do. This seems to be about the Messiah. It really bothered me. One day she asked me if I'd ever asked God to show me if Jesus was the Messiah. And I said, no, I don't have to. He isn't. And she said, well, what are you afraid of? So because of her challenge, I offered the single worst prayer in the history of humanity. It was like, God, I know Jesus isn't the Messiah, uh, but if he is, and I know he isn't, <laughs> you can show me, but I know you won't, because he isn't, amen. <laughs> but God did show me, and it's a whole long story about how I became convinced. That, but the ultimate m message for me was I understood that the Messiah was the ultimate fulfillment of the sacrificial system, that I needed a sacrifice for my sin. And that if I were to be a good Jew, if Jesus were really the predicted Messiah, a good Jew would believe in him. And uh, it, it, that's what convinced me. And I became a follower of Jesus. Now, the good news for me, because I do doubt, is I have studied Messianic prophecy, not just on that superficial level that I did back when I was a teenager, but I've studied it as part of my doctoral studies. I've written a book on it, which I wouldn't mind if you bought, uh, <laughs> called The Messianic Hope. I've taught courses in Messianic prophecy for years. And in fact, I think I'll be teaching one here in January in the winter. And uh, we'll study Messianic prophecy on a little bit more technical way. But it is a great way to reestablish our confidence in the Word of God, being truly inspired, predicting the Messiah, and also confirm our confidence that Jesus is the fulfillment of those prophecies. It's not just proof texting, it's seeing how the law, the prophets, and the Psalms all point to him. So, 
Remember the evidence. What convinced you? Was it the empty tomb? Was it a changed life? Go back. Review the evidence. There's a second way that we can deal with doubt, and that is accept God's approval. What I think is so interesting is that we tend to beat ourselves up when we doubt. We think God just has no use for us. And you could just imagine what those crowds were thinking when they heard John sending his disciples with this doubt. And they thought, oh, wow, Jesus is really going to let John have it right now. Right? Uh, But he doesn't. What does he say? He commends John. He says, look, who would you go out to see? A king? No. Did you go out to see someone who was uh, a reed swaying? No. You would see a tough guy. John was no wimp. What would you go out? You went to see a prophet. And in fact, he says, you went to see a very special prophet, the one that was predicted back in Malachi, back in Isaiah. This is, he quotes here from Malachi 3.1. The point is, uh, you went out to see John, who was the fulfillment of this prophecy in Malachi 3.1. That's who you went out to see. And in fact, he goes on and says, John is the greatest of all the prophets. Now, this is not what you expect when John is doubting. But Jesus affirms John as the greatest of the prophets, the forerunner of the Messiah. <laughs> He's not some loser. He's the greatest prophet. Well, what I think is so interesting is Jesus doesn't just affirm John. Because you could just imagine, he knows our thoughts. He knows the thoughts of those people listening to that situation. He knows our thoughts as we read it. And here's what he says. I know what you're thinking. If John doubts and he's the forerunner, what about me? What a loser I am. And what's he say? If you look at it, he says, from the days of John the Baptist until, I'm sorry, verse 11, I assure you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John the Baptist. None has appeared, except for some. The least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. (laughs) That's me, and that's you. We are the least in the kingdom of heaven. And we're even greater than John. And we have doubts. And yet, we are affirmed. Isn't that amazing? How can we be greater than John? I think think back of Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, number one pilot in World War I, scored more uh, kills than any other World War I flying ace. Man, he was a great pilot, right? Those little biplanes. You know, the least in the Air Force today, the least F-14 fighter pilot, the guy that finished the academy at the bottom of the list, he's greater than Captain Eddie Rickenbacker. And the reason the least of us is greater than John the Baptist is the greater the revelation, the greater the prophet. And we have far more revelation than John did. We've got the whole New Testament and we can proclaim it. So the least, even with our doubts, greater than John. I think that's so great. If we feel beat up by self-recrimination, self-criticism, you know what God does? He puts his arm around us. He says, yeah, yeah, I know. You're great in my book. I still want to use you. So what should we do? Remember the evidence. Accept God's approval. Third. Correct false expectations. John, Jesus corrects John's false expectations. Uh, John expected the Messiah would put a stop to all opposition and the kingdom would come to earth. But there was plenty of opposition. Now look at verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence and violent men have been seizing it by force. This is a very tough uh, tough passage to translate, to be honest. And, you know, what you should do when you forget all your Greek 
is work in your English Bibles and then find those passages where all the translations are different. And then you know you've got a translation problem. It's, that's really true. And then try and remember what you learned in Greek. Uh, but I, I think that this is, I think, closest translation that gets it right, using the middle voice about applying force. It's basically saying that the kingdom is forcefully advancing and violent men are opposing it. That's what I think this verse is saying. The kingdom is forcefully advancing and violent men are opposing it. Basically, what Jesus is saying is John thought, and you guys think, that once the Messiah comes, the kingdom is here, and it's going to advance forcefully, and that means there won't be any opposition. There won't be guys like Herod Antipas. But no, the kingdom is advancing forcefully, and there's going to be opposition. You have a false expectation if you think everything is going to be just hunky-dory. There will be opposition to the advancement of the kingdom. And he says, look, Elijah has come. The kingdom has come. If you pick it up in verse 13, all the law and the prophets prophesied until John. If you're willing to accept it, Elijah has come. He's announced the coming of the kingdom, I think in a mystery kind of phase, not the fullness of the kingdom that will come when Messiah reigns on earth, but he has come. And anyone who has ears should listen. The kingdom is advancing, but correct that false expectation. It's going to be opposed. It will be opposed until the Lord Jesus takes his throne right here on earth. Don't be surprised when there's opposition. One of the reasons I think that we doubt is we have this false expectation of how wonderful life is going to be once we come to know the Lord Jesus. I call it the joy ride with Jesus. I was sold that. If you trust in Jesus, everything's going to be perfect. I'm telling you, as soon as I became a believer, everything went to being terrible. <laughs> it went from really good to terrible. The first thing that happened is my dad disowned me. Never really talked to me again, ever. Uh, then, of course, I became the butt of all kinds of jokes in a Jewish neighborhood in Brooklyn. I'm thinking, oh, this is really cool. If you expect that joy ride with Jesus, just let me correct your thoughts. It's not going to be perfect. Now, listen, I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 1957, the peak of the baby boom. We won Times Man of the Year in 1967. Did you know that? This is what it said about us in uh, 1967. In its lifetime, this promising generation could land on the moon, check, cure cancer, the common cold, lay out blight-proof, smog-free cities, end racial prejudice, enrich the underdeveloped world, and no doubt, write an end to poverty and war. How are we doing so far? <laughs> if ever there was a group of people that had false expectations, it's my generation. And we recognized that very early on, I became a believer during the Jesus generation. And we thought we were going to just see Jesus come as soon as, you know, the late great planet Earth hit its millionth sale, you know, and <laughs> Jesus is coming. And now, for me, it's 43 years, and he still hasn't come, and the world seems to be getting worse and worse, and I have to correct my false expectation of what life is supposed to be like. I'll tell you the truth. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. That's what you should expect. But fear not, I've overcome the world, Jesus said. Listen, we need to get true, real expectations. And then we won't be disappointed, and we won't doubt. So what should we do? Review the evidence. Secondly, we should accept God's approval. Third, we should uh, get correct expectations. And then fourth, we need to beware of dissatisfaction. We can get dissatisfied pretty easily. And Jesus talks about this in verses six through, 16 through 19. He said, what's this generation like? Like children sitting in the marketplace saying, we played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament. You didn't mourn. In fact, this marketplace, these children 
are saying, whatever we wanted of you, you weren't it. Whatever we wanted you to do, you didn't do. And then he says, John came, did not come eating or drinking. And they said, look, he has a demon. See, look how ascetic, ascetic he is. That's demonism. And Jesus came, you know what? Jesus came eating and drinking. He was a friend of sinners, it says, tax collectors, a glutton and a drunkard. In fact, if you read the Gospels, every time there's a dinner party, Jesus says, okay, I'll go. <laughs> and if there's no wine, he'll make it. <laughs> it is amazing how much fun Jesus is having with people. That's not the kind of guy we want as a Messiah. Whatever it is, what John was and what Jesus, that's not what we want. In fact, nothing will satisfy some people. Nothing. There was a farmer who had a neighbor that was like that, always complaining. Probably you've heard Chuck Swindoll hear this, tell this story. If not, I'll tell you. But... Uh, he was the uh, wet blanket in the linen closet of life, Swindoll says. <laughs> the farmer decided to impress this man, so he bought the world's greatest hunting dog. He trained it thoroughly and invited his friend to watch him hunt. He showed the neighbor how this dog could stand motionless for an hour. He could pick up a scent a mile away. Guy didn't care. Finally, he shoots a duck. The dog runs out onto the lake, never swims, just runs on the water, <laughs> gets the duck, runs back, drops it down in front of the hunter, and his friend says, dog can't swim, can it? <laughs> Nothing can satisfy some people. The point is, we dare not be those people. God says, listen, I've given you, through Jesus, everything you need, even in the disappointments of life. He's given us all the evidence we need. He's given us all the approval we need. He's given us genuine expectations. And if we're still not satisfied, we may not be doubting. That may be the sign of disbelief. Beware. Beware of that. Don't become the kind of person who is dissatisfied with everything. Well, what causes doubts? Painful experiences, right? Difficult circumstances. But what cures it? Meeting the living word and listening to what he says. Well, let me just give you three quick takeaways. I gotta quit. Ready? One, be in the word. The only way to deal with doubt is not to stop reading the word, but to keep reading the word. Even as a seminary student, let me just suggest something. One of the best things I learned in seminary was to actually read the Bible apart from anything, just to read the Bible. Uh, I, my first class right in here, Howard Hendricks, Bible Study Methods, and he told us all about how to read Acts 1-8, right? But then he told us that we also need to just read the Bible. What a shocking idea. And very quickly I saw that's what I needed. Read the Bible. Be in the Word. Don't quit. When, even when you're having difficulties, be in the Word. Secondly, be in community. We need a community of believers. Join a church. I joined a church when I came here. Uh, Stanley Toussaint was the pastor, pastor. Went there for four years. One of the best experiences of my life because I wasn't with any other seminary students hardly. And I was just with other believers. We are like people who need AA, you know, recovering alcoholics. They need to be in community. They need to go to meetings. We need to go to meetings too, you know. We are recovering sinners, and we need to be in community. And if we don't go to those meetings, if we don't participate, if we don't encourage others, we're going to start doubting even more. Be in community. Thirdly, be contagious. Share your faith. For me, that's the best way for me to be encouraged in my doubts, because every time I'm talking to someone who doesn't know the Lord, and I have to defend my faith, I start talking to myself instead of listening to myself. And it is one of the most encouraging things 
to have to share my faith and defend it. So be contagious. You know, people ask me how I can believe this after my family experienced so much in the Holocaust. How can you believe this? Well, I can't not believe it. I think the evidence is so strong. But when I do have doubts, I'm reminded of this. There is a ally sweeping through France. They went to a cleaning up. They're cleaning up after the Nazis, trying to get the last of the Nazis out. And they went into a farmhouse. And there, in the basement, they saw where a Jewish victim of the Holocaust had been hiding. And a girl had written on the wall and scratched Star of David, and she wrote, I believe in the sun even when it does not shine. I believe in love even when it is not shown. I believe in God even when he does not speak. If she could say that, how can we not say that? We who have experienced God's forgiveness in Jesus, we can say, I believe in Jesus even when it's difficult, even when I'm disappointed, because there's no one else as true as he is. Let's pray. Father, I'm really grateful to be here today. Lord, I pray that your word would encourage us over and over to be strengthened in our commitment. And when we do encounter those periods of doubt, Lord, renew us by your word through the living word, the Lord Jesus. Amen.